lessons for today. Our gospel lesson today is from the Good News according to Luke, the 18th chapter. We're on page 99 in the New Testament portion of our Pew Bible. Luke 18, beginning at verse 9, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. People were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they sternly ordered them not to do it. But Jesus called for them and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Here ends the reading of the good news. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, many of you know that this past Thursday evening was a Packers-Bears game, and uh, so we had a little Packer tailgate party downstairs in Fellowship Hall and had a worship service together. And I suspect it was because I had football on the brain that when I read our lessons for this week, I kept thinking about football stories from my own past and how they connected with the stories. So I had considered on Thursday night preaching a sermon entitled, Why Jesus is Better Than a Bratwurst, and I decided not to do that one. I, I thought about preaching why the G on the side of the Packer helmet doesn't stand for God's favorites, or why the C on the Bears helmet didn't stand for Christ's chosen ones. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there were things from my own personal experience and connected with football that made sense for me with our lessons for today. So let me ask you this. How many of you grew up in a neighborhood or currently live in a neighborhood where kids choose up sides to play football, kickball, four square, or whatever. Some of you have had that experience. So I grew up in this neighborhood where we had two guys who were like the star athletes in the neighborhood. There was Joe Namath Hag and Johnny Unitas Fissel. Now, a lot of you younger people don't know who Joe Namath was, and you may not know who Johnny Unitas was, but they were big football stars in their day, kind of like Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre. So, I wondered if when those two guys were the captains choosing up teams, if they didn't stand there and think to themselves, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like all the other kids in the neighborhood, slow and weak and unable to throw the ball or to catch it. They would choose up sides and pick the best players for their teams. And I'd stand there and think, pick me, pick me, pick me. And then one of them would say, you take little Ingy, I don't want him. I was young compared to most of the kids in the neighborhood, and I was slow, and I wasn't the best athlete. So I would go and play anyway, and my little sister would be there with her blankie wanting to play, and they'd tell her, yeah, you just be a cheerleader. You go get water. We'd be standing in the huddle, and I'd come back. I'm wide open. Nobody's covering me. And they'd pat me on the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I knew I wasn't going to get the ball. Go deep. Go long. And so one day I was standing down there deep and long. And you know what? I looked up and there was the ball coming right at me. What was I to do? I hadn't learned yet that to catch a football, one ought to make a triangle shape with your fingers. That's a much safer way to catch a football. Instead, no, I did the old breadbasket catch and got the point right there. <coughs> I caught the ball, but I was going to die. I had no air left in me. And I realized that even though I wasn't very fast and I was kind of small and I didn't really know the right to, way to catch a football, I got to win the game. I grew up. My parents fed me and I grew. <laughs> Seventh and eighth grade, I was on the heavyweight football team. I was dominant. I was big and strong, playing both ways, and I became one of those guys who looked down on other people, like we, Wiry Willie and Toothpick Tom. But something happened between 8th grade and ninth grade, and ninth grade and 10th grade, and suddenly we, Willie, we Wiry Willie had become Way Wide Willie, and Toothpick Tom had become Totem Pole Tom. And I had gone back to being Little Ing again. I stopped growing. The guy you see standing up here preaching today weighs about the same he did as a senior in high school. Those guys went on to get Division I college football scholarships. So, I decided maybe I would go play football at a small school in Wisconsin, Carthage College. Because I figured if it's a small college, that means the football players will be small. <laughs> uh, no. They were big. You talk about the separation of men and boys. I was slower than I'd ever been in my life when I started playing college ball. And in that very first week of practice in August when nobody else is on campus, there I was trying to be tough as I could be and I caught a helmet right in the chin and knocked me out. I have no idea how long I was knocked out. All I remember is the awful smell of the ammonia smelling salts that they used to wake you up in those days. And they'd pat you on the back and say, Go get him, tiger. I woke up the next morning throwing up. Now, I suspect that that was concussion, right? Today we talk about percussion, or concussion protocols. But back then, all that meant is that I was chicken. And I figured maybe I better go talk to the coach. Said, I've never felt like this before. I don't think I should play football anymore. I'm too nervous to play. I was getting sick. And the coach said, well, that's all right. I need an equipment manager. I said, I don't want to do that. Well, you get to travel with the team. Why don't you try it out? You might like it. I have to tell you that becoming an equipment manager and then an assistant trainer was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me and probably one of the best training fields for me for becoming a pastor. I learned how to fix cleats and broken shoulder pads and broken helmets and to tape ankles and to put ice packs on people. One of the things that happened is that there would be players who would line up at my training table and they wouldn't go out to play until I had taped their ankles. And I started to think that that must be because I was pretty good at taping ankles. And then I realized that it was pretty much just like Cubs fans who don't change their underwear when their team wins. It was all about superstition. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is what I learned. I was one of the little people, one of the guys who wasn't on the field, and yet all of the players depended on me to get the Gatorade, to get everything ready, to tape their ankles so that they could be in the game. It was a true servanthood role. 
it was a true servanthood role. And I realized that every member of the team, even those little people often behind the scenes and on the sidelines, were very important to winning the game. So, how does all of this fit in with our lessons for today? Number one is this. None of us are left standing there waiting to be picked. Jesus picks all of us first. This is an amazing, amazing mystery, but it is true. No matter who you are, no matter whether you're strong or weak, big or tall, slow or fast, it doesn't matter. God loves us exactly the way he made us, and he chooses each of us first. We are the apple of his eye. All of us are a part of the body. One of the things that I often think about with this is that, you know, in the kingdom of God, there are no grandpas and grandmas, no moms or dads. There are only fellow brothers and sisters. All of us, regardless of our age, are all children of God. That's amazing to me. That's why you'll never hear me say that I think children are the future of the church, as if they have to somehow grow up or become more mature. Children are the church now. They already matter now. Jesus embraces all of us regardless of our age now. That's the wonderful part of this story, you see. The disciples think, Jesus doesn't have time for kids. You're not important enough. You're too small. Why would he pick you to be his disciple? And yet, Jesus does exactly that. Let the children come, for to these the kingdom of God belongs. And so, it is amazing also to me that no matter what our age or what our ability, Jesus decides to use us for the work of the kingdom. The truth is, all of us are broken. All of us fall short. All of us are like these great big football players that I used to take care of who are out there running around and suddenly they turn into little wimps because something hurts. Their fingers sticking straight out the side of their hand didn't help sometimes when they had to put those back in. But you get it. And maybe you've heard of turf toe I have to tell you, that's a real injury. If you injure your big toe that way, you can't play the game. You can't keep your balance. You can't run. So Jesus knows how important it is for all of us to be forgiven and to be healed, for the parts of the body to all work together. And if we leave any part of the body out, then we're not complete. We don't do the job that he wants us to do. And so Jesus forgives us and he heals us and he brings us together. I wanted to remind you this morning that God is your biggest fan. God is the one who is cheering for you, watching you in life, seeing you share his love. Yes, we make mistakes. We have things go against us. We get injured. But God is our biggest fan the one who is there to pick us up and send us back into the game again. One time I heard something that I'd like to share with you, and it's the final image I want to send you with today. If God has a refrigerator, your picture is on it. It's a pretty big refrigerator, I guess, huh? But it's a great image to be reminded that all of us are children of God and cherished by God, all of us are picked first. All of us, all of us, all of us are important. And that is what Jesus came to let us know. That he came to love us, to die for us, so that we might be forgiven and that we might know what it means to be called a child of God. And so as you go out into the world this week, my prayer for you 
for me and for Christians everywhere is that we will be filled with joy and excitement as we go out knowing that, yes, indeed, we are God's favorites. We are Christ's chosen ones. And we are to share that love with others who don't yet know that they too are a child of God. So blessings to you, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as we share his love with everyone, everywhere. Amen.